Germany. And working in the mental health field and ministry for nearly 10 years, Nathan Reynolds has devoted himself to writing and speaking about things others would rather not be said. His book, as well as interviews and videos, can be found at snatchedfromtheflames.com and YouTube Nathan Reynolds. The first person I met when I arrived at the conference center in California was Nathan Reynolds. I had no idea who he was, but he was standing behind a display table, and I was immediately drawn to his book. I remember Nathan speaking to me, but I was so distracted by what I was reading on the back of his book that I could not focus on his words. Then I looked up at him, and I was struck by the intensity of his eyes. I felt as though he really saw me, and that inexplicably, since we had only just met, that he actually cared about me as a person. The kindness and compassion that emanated from him was palpable and powerful. He asked me if he could inscribe my book, and I simply got it. After he handed the book back to me, I took a cursory glance at the inscription, not really registering what it said, but noticing that he had inscribed something different in the book of my friend Lisa. I came home from the conference and completely forgot about the book. Very soon I was immersed in the planning of the Calgary conference. Matt and Robbie encouraged me very early to pick a name for the conference. I asked my friend Wilk for some ideas and he gave me several. One jumped out at me and I knew immediately it was the one, Truth Quest Calgary. It was several weeks later that I decided to dig out Nathan's book because I wanted to finish reading it before the conference. As I opened the book to the dedication page, I saw Nathan's inscription. To Sarah, may you never cease in your quest for truth and understanding. Nathan Reynolds. <laughs> Any doubts that I had about whether I was being guided by my Heavenly Father vanished when I read that inscription. On a more personal note, I did finish reading Nathan's book, and I have to say that it was the most incredible testimony I have ever heard. The way that Nathan speaks about his Savior brought tears to my eyes many times, and my heart literally ached for him as a little child as he shared the horrors of his past. But the most amazing thing about Nathan's book was that it pointed the way to healing. I have been desperate for emotional and spiritual healing for many years, and I have tried just about anything and everything to find it. Nathan's courage in exposing his darkest secrets also revealed those parts of my own life that needed to come into the light and ultimately to the one who is the only way, the truth, and the life. There was never any doubt in my mind as to which scripture passage was for Nathan today. Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me that I may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. From fury to faith, can a coward be cured? Nathan, come and fearlessly share your testimony. as I talk because it's a lot easier for uh, me to kind of get my little anxious energy out that way and then it can hide my little quirks for you guys, all right? So I'm sorry, Daniel. I'm sorry ahead of time for all that. But Sarah, I can't even start to express what that means to me uh, that you shared that. Um, it's a very uh, important moment for me when I get a, 
hand somebody a book that I've written and be able to have a moment to look them in the eyes and see them as a person. Because there's so many other books that are out there, right? We're all inundated continually with this vast hunger for truth, for understanding, for knowledge, for information. Each and every person that is in this room is here. Every one of you has a story that deserves to be shared, that deserves to be told. And it's very humbling that some of you would entrust your time, your energy, your hard-earned money to buy a book from a stranger for all intents and purposes that you know nothing about. And so if I have an opportunity to look someone in the eyes and share something for it, I try to make every single time be individualized, be pertinent to what that person's going through. But I, I knew nothing about Sarah. I had no idea who she was, where she was, or where she was at. But I'm so encouraged to hear that that impacted her in the way that it did. And I t I'm just praying that my time up here would offer each and every one of you something impactful for you that you take out of here that is not just lingering in the back of your mind that radically transforms the trajectory of your life and the lives of the people around you. I'm not interested in selling you my book. I'm interested in changing the lives of the people in this world for the power and the glory of the kingdom of God forever. Amen. Nothing I say here, nothing I say here is for me, is for anybody else in this room to be lifted up, to be slammed down. I'm not here to bash and destroy human beings that have done wicked and evil things. I wage war against the exact entities, spirits, principalities, powers, rulers, dominions, the cosmic rotters of this world. That is who I fight. But I didn't always start out that way. I'm going to give you a very small cautionary warning. I'm going to be talking about some pretty heavy and intense stuff. That being said, I understand there's younger ears in the room, so I'm going to cater it a little bit to their audience, all right? And so I hope you guys will be mindful of that. I will give small innuendos, if you will, to some of the things rather than a lot of specifics. If you want those, you can go to the book for that. If you want those, you can go to my website as well, where I have the book on there for free. If anybody that needs it, please just let me know, okay? It's a big, long introduction, but I would really like to, us all to just take one quick second and please thank Sarah for all the work and all of the volunteers for what it is that took to get everyone here today. Thank you. There's people in this room that I really believe have every right to be standing exactly where I am today. There's people whose stories, whose testimonies are defeating and driving back the forces of fear, the forces of doubt, the insecurities that are bubbling under the skin for each and every one of us. And I believe each and every one of you needs to hear me before I get going on any of the rest of this. Do not think that your story matters less if it is not intense or if it is not in a way that you think is worth telling. Okay? The premise of everything that I'm going to do from here on out is because in Revelation 12, 11, it says one thing about the enemy that we fight. It says the enemy, the dragon, that devil of old, is defeated by the blood of the Lamb by the words of our testimony, and not loving our lives even unto death. I titled this talk, From Fury to Faith, and I asked the question, can a coward be cured? I've talked to a lot of people in this room today, I've talked to a lot of people in this room before coming here, and cowardice and being a coward is one of the hardest things we can ever face in our life, is the man in the mirror, is the woman in the mirror, is the doubts, the insecurities, and the self-hatred that we feel. But I was a man who was born into a world that most people do not understand, that most people have never had a glimpse into, apart from maybe a movie, apart from maybe a sensational thriller that you read at one point in your life. On one side of the world, to the outside of the world, what you would call the exoteric side, my family was your poverty level, American family, middle suburbia, that was Christian, they went to church, they took their kids and they put them in private schools. They pulled them out of private schools. They dumped them into public schools. My family shuffled around, hiding in plain sight, under the ruse a very sincere, very authentic, and genuine belief and faith in God and Jesus. They knew everything when it comes to the fundamentals of their faith, and they weren't afraid to share that. So on one side of my life, I had this kind of normal-looking upbringing, but halfway through, right in the middle of that, was this line this demilitarized zone that nobody talked about. And it was into that space that secrets built this bridge. And my family would cross over onto this threshold and they would carry me over into it. And it involved Luciferian rituals. My family, in no uncertain terms, 
really does believe in and worship and give homage and sacrificial offerings to Lucifer, who they believe is Halal ben Shahar, the son of Shahar. They do not worship him as the devil. This is not necessarily what people would just jump to or term Satanism in the same thing. Saying that all these things just get lumped together is one thing. I'm very, very intentional to make sure people understand that. Do not just assume somebody worships the devil because they do occult practices, they do occult workings, or they're in, van they're in new age ideologies. It's really important to not be ignorant of the devil's schemes. That's why the Bible commands us not to be ignorant of him. We need to understand how the enemy works in order for us to be able to overcome that which ensnares us and makes us susceptible to his lies, susceptible to his influence in our lives. My family showed me that there was greater power in the kingdom of darkness than anything that the world or that the kingdom of heaven could ever offer me. And they did that by surrounding me with Christians. They put me in environments in churches where there was this weak, impotent, powerless faith. People that believed sincerely that they were saved, that they were going to heaven, that they had defeated the enemy, that the enemy was defeated and that they could stomp on the devil and all the rest of it. But the day you open your mouth and you start talking about satanic ritual abuse and human sacrifice, their tune changes and they become cowards. And I saw cowards in the Christian body throughout my entire life. And because of that, I was set into a place where I could see if I called upon a different kind of power, I would see pure power come upon me. Power that would allow me to fight back and give me the ability to fight against these people that I could not defeat. And so I was shown at an early age that violence, that sex, that drugs, that mind-altering substances could give me a completely different edge that would ensnare me into his kingdom and give me a power to fight against this horror that I was living in on a regular basis. My grandfather was a high-level Knights of Columbus. He was someone, I've talked to quite a few people in this room who have family members that are in that. Most people assume this is just another fraternal organization. The Pope, the white Pope, as he is referred to in many circles, this is the one who most people think of, right? When you see the Pope driving around in his Pope mobile in the white dress and the garbs and the robe, this is the sign that is given to the world. There is another Pope who is a black Pope, they call it, not by color, but by declaration, and he is the, key, the preeminent general the superior general over the Jesuit order of the Catholic Church. And this is who my family, on one side, worked extortion, racketeering, blackmail, and assassination for. The way they do that is not by recruiting and hiring people to do that kind of work. They raise their children to do it for them. Children are much better to hide in plain sight than adults are. Children, my family used to say, children fit in places adults just can't. And that's a very literal meaning when you can traffic children from state to state and county to county and plant evidence in people's houses and kill them in their sleeping. That is a much more profitable business model than risking what it looks like to mute, send and pay an old grown man to transport child porn pornography across state lines. So they hide it with their children and they make their children believe that what they are doing is actually defeating and fighting against the very pedophiles that are abusing them. So you're trapped inside this world of believing that there's no power in going to God. There's no power that can come upon you if you call upon the name of Jesus. Jared sat here yesterday and talked about at a young age, he was standing in the gap. He was standing in the place that it should have been a grown man who was teaching his son, hey, this is a Ouija board. This is how we deal with it. This is authority. He was, he was a young boy who had faith in his God. And it was childlike, innocent faith. That the, that the God of all creation moved through to empower him to defeat the works of darkness that were driving that child into fear and terror and tormenting them. And I'd just like to ask a quick question. Has anybody in this room experienced the types of activities, spiritual warfare, poltergeist activity, like Jared was describing? Night terrors, things moving around in your house, sleep paralysis, that kind of things. By and far, almost every time I ask this question, I see about a third of the hands go up in this room. A third of the people in this room have been plagued with that. How many people that are dealing with that that you know in your life that have never talked about it? People don't talk about these things, and yet we need to. Because there's kids that are going to our schools today that are battling nightmares that you guys can't possibly start to comprehend unless you've lived it. There is a physical and spiritual war being continually waged over the souls of men and women and children every single day of our lives. And so I was trapped right in the middle of that battle. And I was an agent for the evil one. 
because I wanted to be something more than I was. We have a hole inside us that can never be satisfied. It can never be filled. There's nothing in this world that can satisfy the fury that was in my heart for the abuses that had been done to me and the abuses that I saw done to the people that I cared about. I had learned helplessness. I had convinced myself that there was no way out except violence. Violence was my cure. Violence was how I scratched the itch, and I felt like revenge was a way that I could finally be at peace in my heart. So for years of my life, I was addicted to this path, and at 17 years old, the military offered me a package where I could go and serve them, and they would give me a state sanctioning for the same types of violence to go and do wet work for them, so that I could go and operate with a license to kill for them instead. And I learned a trade where they give you medals for doing horrible, disgusting, evil things. But we promise we only do it to bad people, right? We never do that to teachers and, and principals and people that are pastors. We never plant evidence and control corporations and make sure that a business deal is done according to our will and not the other will. The vast majority of the people that are living today have no concept of understanding the real way the world works. Mark is standing here, Robbie is standing here, giving people an illustration and understanding that at the fundamental cores of everything we've come to know in this world, there are cracks in the foundations that show, look it, they've been lying from the beginning to us. From the day your child is born, you are being called to be lying to them. You are called to deceive them. You are being created to be an image bearer of the father of lies on this earth, and we are predisposed to do that. It's what our flesh craves. We want the easy way out. We want the path of least resistance. We will always do that. But what is it? What does it take to grab somebody out of that? Why is it that you guys are in this room today when you could be anywhere else in the entire world? At any other moment in your life, you could be anywhere else. But why are you here? What's the common denominator that brings people into a room like this to hear people talk about very uncomfortable things? And I believe there is an insatiable need to know in each and every one of you. I believe that you have a hunger inside of you that made you need to understand what was really going on. I just talked to a woman who's, who told me that her son had autism at 10 years old, and it started her on this thought of wondering, what is going on? And why do I need to start researching these things like vaccines? And that led into this other area. Another person I talked to, it was because they had been so addicted to drugs and pornography that they'd been enriched by it truly grown profitable on it, but they got to a place in their life where they slammed into a wall and they realized that it was going to destroy everything around them. And they had a choice to make. And that choice was whether we continue in that path or we make a decision to come out of it. And I really believe that God made that decision for me a very hard way. And I was on an operation and doing the types of work that I had done for many years of my life. And I got to a place where I began to see that you could convince me that someone was a pedophile. I would go and do this kind of work for you. And I started to see at the end of the day that they were lying to me on a regular basis, that I had no idea what was really going on, and I was getting tired of being someone else's yes man. I didn't want it to be this way, but God ripped me out of that world, and he dropped me out of that as a disabled veteran and planted me in Boulder, Colorado, and I began to study psychology because I had shattered my mind, and I wanted it fixed. I wanted to be well. I wanted to know what it was to be normal. I wanted to experience a normal night of sleep without the interruptions of dreams, without the memories that plagued me. I wanted to know peace, but I did not know him. I heard of him. I heard of him. I prayed to him. I was no less sincere in my belief and my convictions of being a Christian, of being raised in a Christian environment. I loved God, but I was addicted to the evil, and I could not escape it. And I didn't know what to do. But he did. He always knows what to do with each and every one of us. There's a lot of people in this room whose children don't know what they're doing, who think they do, and are making very bad decisions and it breaks your hearts. It's gut-wrenching to hear Emily's story. I've got a lot of time to get to know Emily Pittsburgh. I've got to see her photo albums of her children I got to see and hold her as she talked about these things that people can't fathom. But some of your children have done these same kinds of things and have left the path of truth and have embraced a lie. It's horrible. 
It should not be this way, but it is. My question for you is, what are you willing to do for the sake of the truth? You have to be the example for your children. Emily stands up here and talks about brutally painful things to talk about because she loves her daughter. She loved her son. But she lost her son. God never lost her son. But she loves her daughter enough to stay the truth and to stay the course. And I hope each and every one of you will be willing to do the same for the sake of your children, for the sake of your family members, because they're watching you. Even when they mock you. Even when they hate you. You must love them. You must forgive them. The hardest person to forgive in the room is almost always the man in the mirror. Because you sit there and you wonder if I could have done something different. If I could have just told my daughter something different when she was eight years old, maybe she wouldn't be waiting to get a sex change tomorrow. We think we could have control more than we really can. And that's the lie. It's the lie. It's what makes us burn with fear. It's what makes us cowards. Because we hate the way it feels when our family abandons us. We hate the way it feels when they mock us. We want to talk about a topic like flat earth. You want to talk about a topic like any of these things we've addressed in here today is going to make you unpopular immediately. Immediately. So I'm stuck at this age, going to college, waiting to see something in my life shift. And into my life, I began to encounter these people that were bold that had something different going on in their lives than anything I'd encountered in the church before. And these people weren't operating within the confines of the church. They were outcasts. They were the pariahs. They were hated by the church. And yet here I am listening to people that were willing to talk about these conspiratorial fringe topics and be mocked and belittled for the sake of what they believed, and they kept coming back for more. I didn't understand that. I had not seen that connected to Jesus Christ before. These people said they loved him, and then they loved people enough to say things that offended them greatly. They were willing to throw people's sin in their face and say, you are broken, irreparably broken. And they were willing to say there is one and only one who can cure you, and it is he who made you. Jeremiah 1 talks about the knitting together in the womb before you were knit together in your womb. I knew you. Every single one of us in this room was knit together. I absolutely believe that. I'm not even going to start to talk to people about hybridization and clones and AI and all the challenges that come with that. I absolutely believe that our Father is intimate in the act of creation as He breathed out His life into dust, into Adam, and made Him a living soul. He has breathed into us an image of Him that will never be satisfied, that will never be totally fulfilled unless we come to know Him. And I began to walk in a relationship with the Father that I had never had before in my life. I desperately eked my way out of this underworld that I'd been in for so many years, and I wanted to grab a hold of something better than anything I'd known. And it was into that moment that a woman walked into my life who I knew nothing about. Her name was Chelsea. And she saw a man who went by the name Nate, an outgoing, public, popular, happy to meet you kind of guy who was passionate, evangelistic for his faith, who was involved in a church and a college ministry that would end up becoming one of the most successful college ministries in the United States. I watched a smaller church become a mega church for the sake of watering down the gospel and giving the world what they demanded so we could grow a better business. I was a man who loved passionately and deeply and found joy in the most meaningless and tiny things in order to endure the things that had been happening to me throughout my life. So we fell in love. And our, my book chronicles our story. And it's really a love story in the beginning. And it's all beautiful, right? Everybody, the boy meets girl and they fall in love and they live happily ever after, right? Anybody have that story yet? Nobody in this room, right? Because that's not how it works. Because life still is going to happen and everything that you ever had going on in your life is going to be boiling to the surface in your marriage. There's no way around it. You cannot hide. You cannot hide behind the masks of what you've always shown the world when you're in your marriage house. You can't do it. Sooner or later you will be found out. And I was found out. 
Three years into my marriage, I became a very different person than my wife. For those of you that aren't aware of how the mechanics of ritualistic abuse and of mind control really operates, it really plays out in a very difficult way to articulate to people. But within a person, you have the ability, when you're going through significant and horrific amounts of trauma and or mental stress, to shatter your psyche, to split your soul, and to develop multiple personalities. So many of the cults, many of the families, many of the secret societies have discovered over thousands of years of practice how to shatter the mind and create separate and distinct personalities so that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And it is in this that they are able to create somebody that believes that everything with sincerity, that they're a good agent for the kingdom of God. And behind the scenes at night, they have a night walker side, a different personality that takes over and goes and engages in these activities. So that they, when they wake up in the morning, after they've been up all night engaging in these horrific things, they don't know why they're puking blood. They don't know what it is that these marks on their body came from. They don't know why they're terrified to look at their grandfather in the face and to get nauseous every time they see him. You develop all these fears, these phobias that you have no idea where they come from, but they plague you throughout your life. So I had developed multiple personalities at a young age, and it was by that my family was able to use me for their profiteering models that they'd instructed me to do. So halfway into my marriage, my family decides it's a better idea to go profit off my services again and get me involved in their family again, and they switch my personalities. Anybody else seen their, their spouse go through a major shift as you were going along? It's a nightmare sometimes. Because what do you do? Who talks about these kinds of things? I changed my name, changed my haircut, changed everything I knew about me. Literally burned my phones, burned everything I'd ever had in my past life. Destroyed every single social bridge that I'd ever encountered so I could be a go, go be a lone wolf and hunt at night again. But I'm in a marriage that I can't escape. And that's horrifying language that I hate that even comes out of my mouth. But I woke up to a stranger one day. And she was my wife. And she woke up to a man who she knew didn't love her in the way that he once did. And our marriage ever so slowly fell apart. We had no idea what was going on. She had no idea who I was. I began to have knives strapped to my body everywhere I went. Waking, sleeping, no matter what happened, I had to have blades on my person or firearms within arm's reach so that I could go do the work if I was called up. I needed to be able to defend myself and protect myself from things that were coming after us that she knew nothing about. I was hiding from cameras and living this undercover life all the while she doesn't know what's going on. And nobody is giving us answers because we don't know what question to ask. Who do you ask these questions to? Who do you call when there's shadows crawling across your wall and your Bible's flying across the room? Oh, call a Catholic priest, right? What could go wrong? But that's the answer. You call a Christian church, you know who they'll tell you to call? The exorcist. Let's go call a pagan priest to come and do a ritual over you, to call one demon in, to deliver you from a different demon. There is a hierarchy in the kingdom of darkness, and they invoke a higher order spirit in order to move one spirit from a certain location into another so that you believe there is cure. You believe that your child's been cured of their night terrors. And by doing so, you pledge your allegiance to the Catholic Church, and they've recruited you. Dr. Walter Biden, a man who has done a great job at exposing many aspects of, of the Roman Catholic Church in the Seventh Day through the Seventh Day Adventists. I don't agree with everything he has to say. However, his testimony is one I really believe is an incredibly important one for those of you who have been unmade, had touched into the Catholic Church and dealt with these kinds of things. Because once you start to understand that they are not going to be able to cure you of this, that there is only one who will be able to do that, and you don't need a priest to have a deliverance. You need the deliverer. And he is a person who was a man who took on flesh, who came and made his dwelling among us and suffered a life that you and I have suffered. It says he was tempted and suffered in every way we've suffered. And that's the only reason I put my faith in who he is. Because he's not far off. Because he understands the pains that I've suffered. He knows what it is to be mocked. His own family members turned on him and tried to drag him out of his ministry and said he was crazy. By a show of hands, how many people in this room have been called crazy for what you believe? Never feels good. It never feels good. You weren't crazy the moment before you told them that, right? <laughs> Maybe we all are. I 
I ended up going to a conference in 2013. There was a man there named Russ Dizar. And he had a talk that was called The Satanic Infiltration of the Church. My wife and I read the topic, and she goes, oh my gosh, that sounds terrifying. I was like, yeah, we should probably go. <laughs> Breathing hard. And he gets on the stage, and if any of you have ever seen Russ Dizar, he's a very big man, tall, imposing person. And as soon as he gets on the stage, you know it. Because he starts talking about things that are absolutely your nightmare. He's talking about split personality multiples who are sent in to infiltrate a church and become friends with the pastor's wife and to have an affair with the pastor to make sure to split the church and or compromise the pastor so that the day of their choosing, they can destroy that church if ever good fruit is being born in it. It's called compromise. They compromise people. And they do that by making sure that you have done things, said things, or been a part of things that you wish never had happened. And once they have you, they believe they own you. Because you are always going to be ruled by your deepest secrets. The reason I speak my story, the reason I share these horrific things that I've done, that were done to me, and that were done to the people that are in my family, is because I cannot stand here and bear witness to the living God, knowing that I did not do everything in my power to make sure I exposed this. I covered up horrific things for so many years. I was the cleanup guy when things got out of control. And it plagued me. They, there's a saying that people say, God, there is no rest for the wicked. And it's true. There was not a day in my life that I had rest. My family members do not know that kind of peace. The people that rule from these positions of power, these people that have prestige and class, we point at people like the Rockefellers, we point at people like the Rothschilds, and we say, these monsters, these pariahs, you know nothing of what their world is like. You do not know the temptations that ensnare you when you're born into it. Outsiders, it's always easy to point the finger and say these people are the worst people in the history of the world. They are no different than you or me. There is nothing even in their blood or in their mindset that does not mean that you or you or you could not be just as wicked and evil. Because the truth is, every single one of us has in our heart a predisposition to be a monster. Anybody ever yell at their children when you wish you had it? Anybody ever say something to a friend you wish you'd take it back? We've done horrible things. Destroyed people's lives by words that came out of our mouths. You may never have killed anybody. You may never have taken the life of another human being and shut them from ever knowing the truth of the future. But you've shattered people's lives by the things that have come out of your mouth. God calls our tongue a restless, vile, wicked thing. It's a lying, deceiving thing that can come out of here. It's like a little tiny spark that can set a whole forest ablaze. One little tiny misstep, one little misspoken word can destroy your marriage, can destroy your child's life. So what do we do with that? What do we do with these people who are the personifications of evil? What do you do with someone like Aleister Crowley or Jack Parsons? What do you do with L. Ron Hubbard, a man who created a religion that has brainwashed and infected our society at more levels than you can start to comprehend? What do you do with those people when you have a single person that everyone points to and goes, he's the monster? He's just a man. They're just people. They're just people. God says he is, he is angry with the wicked every single day. That is why they'll never feel rest. They feel his anger. They feel it. We are supposed to pray for them. We are supposed to have compassion on them and ask that the God would forgive the wicked works that they have done, the things that have happened to them, that he would open their eyes and have mercy on them. We are supposed to love our enemies. We are supposed to love our enemies. That makes no sense. That makes no sense whatsoever. And yet here we are, standing in a room, talking about these people that do things that deceive our children. And it makes us furious. And we want somebody to point our anger at. And so we choose a man. We choose a woman. We choose an institution. We point at NASA, the forked tongue of the serpent coming out of their mouths. These people are under the influence of spiritual forces that connive and conspire to make sure that there is an agenda advanced every day, regardless of whether or not they're alive. They do not care about these people. They are pawns in the game. 
It's a game to them. Yes, they know they're defeated. That does not change the stakes because your soul is delicious in their eyes. They want company in their kingdom. And they're very good at recruiting. Why aren't we better at recruiting than they are? Because we're cowards at the end of the day, the vast majority of the time. I've been a coward almost my entire life. I hid everything I'd ever done from the woman I love more than anybody in the world. She never once threw a rock at me and said, don't talk about this stuff, you're a monster. She never did that. So why wouldn't I tell her the truth? Why wouldn't I share with her the secrets of what I've been a part of? Because I was afraid. I was so afraid she would leave me. I was so afraid she would reject me. I was so afraid that I would be alone. And I didn't want to be alone anymore. Being alone is miserable. But it's better to be alone with the God who heals than it is to be in the company of a bunch of strangers who just want your pocketbook. I've had the opportunity to be in the room with some extraordinarily influential and wealthy people. I've been in the room with very ordinary people as well. And you know what I realized? They're all the same. The struggles that are in their lives are just like ours. They just look a little different and it's just scaled up. They still deal with the same insecurities that you feel. They still put on a beauty mask that this world has told them you have to put on in order to be pretty. They wake up not knowing what's going to happen that day, that a simple business merger might destroy everything they've ever worked for in their entire life. That everything they've ever compromised, that all those things they ever said, I would never do, that they one day finally said, fine, just this one time. All those little tiny compromises along the way come and they eat at their peace. So if we're all going to be tempted with the same things, if we're all going to be experiencing these same things, why not make sure that we know it's for the right reasons we suffer those things? That was the decision I had to face three years ago when my wife conceived my daughter. I had a hand in it a little bit. But she carried that child and I had a decision to make when we found out I was pregnant with her. My wife was pregnant with her. I had to decide something that in multi-generational families like mine is whether or not you give over your firstborn. If you want access to the trust fund, you have to be willing to compromise your own child. You speak oaths that are not a joke. You swear destruction of the children that you don't even know exist or will ever exist. I cursed my own children when I was a child, not knowing that that mattered. There's a lot of people who join these fraternal organizations that have no idea that this thing matters at all. So they say these oaths and they don't care. But I had to make a decision of whether or not I was gonna raise my daughter up in the same trafficked world, of whether I teach her how to hunt men at night, of whether I'd let her be a mule for the people or whether I'd prostitute my child out so that I could grow rich and build my kingdom. My family had that same decision to make when I was born. And my family chose different. But I had a decision to make of whether or not I really believed that the God of the Bible, that the God that we talk about when we stand in these rooms, was he really true? Was his word really trustworthy? Could we trust him? And so I laid everything out on the table for him and I said, whatever it takes, please heal me. And so he did. And I went back into that mindset of remembering what Russ Dizdar had said at that conference that shook my soul because he stood there and exposed those very secrets that I'd spent my whole life trying to protect and be a guardian of, that my family for hundreds of years had done everything to do to make sure to silence the mouths of the people that spoke these secrets, that we cut the tongues out of people that spoke the secrets and impaled them through their jaws. He spoke those secrets and he was alive. How do you live after speaking this stuff? When I was convinced that anybody who did died. But he talked about the power and the authority of the living God that defeated the enemy thousands of years ago and has defeated him today that can be available to each and every one of you if you will yield to him your life. If you will commit to him every area of your life, he will carry you through those seasons. And so I ended up at a conference in Texas where a man named Tom Dunn prayed for me after I fell on my face when Russ Dizdar had spoken. All I could do was sob on the ground, begging God to heal me. My wife was four months pregnant and still didn't know anything about this. She knew there was something jacked up in me. She knew I'd been abused. She had no idea the levels or why. 
So she sees me down there sobbing hysterically, asking for healing from childhood sexual abuse and for my own sexual addictions. And Tom prayed over me like he's prayed over plenty of people hundreds of times. And if you ever get to meet Tom, he's an incredible guy, but he does not look like your atypical Christian in any sense of the word. <laughs> he's covered in tattoos, he's really tall, and he's got an incredibly passionate story. He loves people more than I can even describe to you. And he loved me as a stranger enough to pray over me. He laid on the ground next to me, laid hands on me, and prayed over me. And God ripped this root out of my freaking mind that had been there since the day I was conceived that had blinded me to his truth. And he gave me an opportunity to start my healing. And right after that, a woman ran up to me the next day and out of nowhere handed me this book and said, this is for you. And I looked at it and it said, prayers for breaking of generational curses of Freemasonry. And I turned around to look back for her and she was gone. I have no idea who that woman was. I don't know if she's ever heard my story. But she put in my hands a key that would unlock my future that never had been offered to me before. A few weeks later, I got home and I threw that book under the bed as quickly as possible. Because I wasn't going to touch that. But as I was praying one morning, the Father brought that to my mind. And I went up there and I prayed through those prayers. And I renounced these sins that I'd done in my life. I asked God to forgive the sins that my ancestors had committed. That were allowing the legal right for the enemy to destroy me. And that wanted to devour my child and the next one to come. And after I prayed those prayers, all hell broke loose. It was a nightmare. It got worse. Everything that I'd ever struggled with in my life exploded in my face. All those little deep, dark secrets that I tried to bury came flooding to the surface all at once. And it was the most horrible experience I can even describe. And I couldn't tell my wife. So I would scream and wail the second she would leave the house, and I would sob like a child under my bed. I could not imagine the exposure that I felt ever seeing the light of day. This was the most embarrassing thing I'd ever encountered in my life, and I never wanted to talk about it. But God kept nudging me that I needed to tell my wife. I was terrified. Because when you tell somebody something that you have come to learn is truth, you give them the power to hurt you. You give people the power to hurt you when you tell them what you believe. And it's awful when you get rejected. It's horrible when they demean you. But it will heal you of your fear of men. It will cure you of your cowardice if you're willing to be open and honest about the things that you have come to know are truth. Everyone in this room has your own struggles, has your own battles that you are facing that you know that God knows. And he wants you to be an overcomer because that's the identity he has given you because greater is he who is in you than the one who is in this world. And we can talk about the hidden hand that is pulling the strings on all of these world orders and all these different people all over the world. And we can all look and see and understand the schemes of the devil that are operating all around us all the time. At the same time, we do not comprehend his power and his sovereign hand to destroy the works of the devil. Because that says the reason that Jesus came to this earth was to destroy the works of the devil. He was to destroy the foundations that the enemy was laying in the hearts of men from the garden till today, till the day it's finished. I went to my family first because I began to experience this healing as I started to divulge these secrets, even if it was just to a journal at first, even if it was just with pen and paper and I wrote these things out and I said, please help me forgive these people that did this to me. Because I knew forgiveness was the key. I knew the fury in my heart was not satisfied by another person dying for what they'd done. It doesn't fix it. If you go kill the people that are destroying this world, another one will pop up and take their place. There's a great little movie that illustrates this called Captain America. I don't know if anybody's seen that in here, little superhero movies. Yep, see, the younger ones do. All of them seen it, yep. There's an organization that's based out of Nazi Germany they call Hydra. They hide in plain sight. They literally, the, the chief of them wears a human mask over his Luciferian, demonic, scary monster face. And they are infected themselves into all of the different realms of society all across the world. And they're insidious because they hide among you. And all of the premise of the film is trying to Captain America, the super genetically modified super soldier who's here to save the day and kick butt. 
He's going to be the one that fixes it all. And at the end of the day, this journey, as you follow that story, you begin to learn that this group and this institution has a motto. And they say, you cut off one head, two shall grow up and take its place. And that's the kingdom of darkness. That's how they view human beings. You're disposable. And so if you can destroy these people, there's, more, there's never enough of them to satisfy that hurt in your heart. But I knew if I could forgive these people, if I could find a way to get healing into this area of my life, it would fix this. And so I finally began to see the power of forgiveness. It began to heal me. And it was like a bomb that finally quenched the fires in my heart. And it extinguished this fire that had always been there. And I felt something that I'd never known. And it was peace. It was a calming of the waters that had always raged. And I no longer was afraid of them. And I went to them and I said, oh my gosh, these are the things that happened, but I need you to know I forgive you. I love you now because I know that he has got me delivered from this spiritual affliction that has been upon me all my life. Chelsea was beginning to see this transformation in me and she's starting to see that I was this new man. These addictions that had, had strongholds over me were fading away. There was good fruit being born in my life. And I thought my family was done with this. I thought my family was so free of this that they would be so rejoicing over it. But little did I know. Little did I know what was about to open up for us. The same day I told my family, I decided I need to tell my wife. So we sat together on a couch and I told her the most deep, dark secrets that I'd ever shared with her. I gave her the power to destroy me. And she did. She destroyed the part of me that needed to die. The part of me that was always afraid of that. The part of me that always knew, hey, if you tell people, they'll leave you. She silenced those lies. She held me. She loved me. She wept with me. She was angry. It should make you angry when you hear about horrible things like this. But you should be careful about where you point the anger. In the next few weeks, my wife and I would go through a living hell as people began to come after her and I and tried to kill us outside of a theater when she was seven months pregnant. And we began to learn and see that there was more power in the kingdom of God to destroy even assassins that are coming after you. And I got to see that I didn't have to fight back against these people, that when six people came to try to kill my wife and I, I didn't fire a single shot, and yet God jammed their weapons and destroyed every plan that they'd had against us and gave us a way out. He showed me that he would fight for me. And he would give me something that I'd never been promised in the kingdom of darkness, which was rest. He gave me rest. And I was exhausted. Eventually I got to a place where my family began to continually threaten the life of my unborn daughter and I had to cut all communication ties with them. I could not bear the thought of them having any access to my daughter, so I separated myself from them continually. It grieved me. Because I still love them. I still love them. Because I don't believe it's the person who destroys the lives of the people around them. But they can be willing contributors to that process. So I got launched into this process of trying to get healing and deliverance. And I sought out counseling for people who deal with people that have dissociative identity disorder. To get healing into these areas of my life, this fractured inner soul of mine. And I began to have so much peace come back into my life. And I was so fired up and I wanted to share this truth and this revelation. And God said, shut your mouth. I had to be quiet about it because I was still in the throes of it. And so for months, Chelsea and I lived in a totally isolated state. I lost my job. We lost all of our friends, most of our family members. Everything in our life completely evaporated that we'd once known as normal. And anybody who's ever come into this journey, I respect you because so many of you have done that for the sake of what you've come to know is truth. You've come to know what it feels like to have your friends mock you and leave you. And all of those people that once used to say, I'll do anything for you, I'll never leave you, all of them lie when you tested them with truth. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Because I had a daughter who was the first generation born free and I have no idea how many of years. No one touched my daughter. They did not defile her because I made a decision that I would trust that God would take care of me more than any trust fund, any affluence, any society, any house, real estate deal, or any other project could ever offer me. I believed that he was El Shaddai. 
He was the guy who takes care of you, looks after you as your father, your friend, your mother, your brother. He would be your all-encompassing, ever-sufficient, ever-exceeding abundance of hope and life and joy. He would fill that hole inside me with an everlasting joy that could not be quenched. That is not to say that I don't experience despair. But I'll tell you what, he gives me satisfaction that is un, un, unexperiential in this world. And I know so many of you in this room have begun to experience those same things in your life when you finally got rid of the lies and you began to embrace the truth. I've been talking to some of you in this room, and I hear something that comes across even as you share your stories with me. And these common threads of something that got hooked in your jaw and began to drag you out of the normal world and drop you into this middle world where all kinds of everything is suddenly up for questionings. And I began to hear that still fear plagues us. And it plagues me too. It's a terrifying thing to finally come to that place of realization. But this entire world has been built upon a false foundation. It says that there is a devil who is the father of lies. And he has built up a foundation so that he can rule this world in his image. And it is like these giant pillars that are the counterfeit pillars of the foundations of the earth. But there is a power that can come upon us that is like living water, it says in the scripture. And it's water, I don't know, has anybody in here ever seen a massive boulder that's got a small crack in it? And has anybody ever watched that crack grow over time? I live, I live in Colorado and I go out into the mountains on a constant basis. That is my place of refuge. And I go to these boulders and I can see these boulders that are bigger than this building that have tiny little slits in them. And what happens is I will go and track it season after season and you will see as water seeps down into there and it freezes, it expands and it splits the rock a little more. And a little more water the next year will come down and it splits the rock a little bit more. And over time and over a long or sometimes very sudden period, that rock will split from something that should never split a rock. And each and every one of you in this room is learning truth and is looking around going, oh my gosh, I wish somebody else was in this room right now. There's people in your heads as Mark is talking or as Jared is talking or as Emily is talking and going, oh my gosh, if only they were in here. If only you heard this and you send them those YouTube videos and you're like, just watch it, please. It'll change you. It'll change. I know it. Like, this is the one. This is the video that will change your life. And you believe it. And what happens? They don't watch it almost ever, right? They almost never have that reaction that you have. So you sit there and you wonder, why, why is it always they're so popular, all these other people teaching these other things, and if, why are there only 115 people in this room? Why aren't there 2 million people here today? Because God is not about using the many to win. One of my favorite things to read through is the book of Judges, because you start to read about these single guys, these single gals, who have this passion of the spirit of power come upon them at a moment of their life, and you know what happened? They did mighty exploits. They did extraordinary things, superhuman things. But they were just people like you and I. We glorify these characters in the Bible like they're something special, but they're just people. David was no different than anybody else in this room when it came to the potential of the day he was born versus the potential each of us had when we were born. But David had an understanding of his identity. And so when he was a little boy, younger than a lot of the people in this room, younger than some of the children in this room, he was the only one who saw the giant in the, in the armor, in this Nephilim hybrid, who's standing there mocking the armies of the living God. He's the only one there who saw him as a defeated enemy. Everybody else saw that giant standing there. But David saw him as a dead man. David knew that man had spoken against the armies of the living God, and God would destroy him for doing so. Gideon was a young man as well, who had no faith really. When you really read his story, he was terrified when God called him to destroy the altars and the sacrificial Asherah poles that were being built up on his own property. God told him, you need to destroy that stuff. He goes, can I do it at night? I don't want anybody to see me. He was scared, because it's scary. It's scary. How many in this room think it would be a good idea if God told you one day to go break down any of those idols in the temples that you see around you? That's what's up, buddy. Nice. I believe that too. But I'll tell you what, Gideon did it that night. He tore down that stuff. The next day all the people rose up and they were ready to destroy him and kill him. But then suddenly his dad stood up. And his dad looked at his son and realized that he had missed it. That his son was doing his job for him. His son did what his dad should have done a long time ago. And tore down this filthy idolatry that was taking over his home. 
you know what happened? They looked at Gideon and they said, you know what? If Baal is so mighty, why doesn't he come defend himself? If these gods are so mighty, why don't they come and defend themselves? We don't say that to bring an accusation against them. But that's the question he asked to the people and suddenly they all thought, well, that's a really good question. Why do I gotta carry this God's idol around everywhere I go? And so they began to be inspired by him. And the few began to shame the many. And so they finally rise up in this big army and they gather all the people of Israel together and they say, we're gonna overthrow our captors, we're gonna defeat them. And there's thousands and thousands of Israelites. And God says, it's too much. And so he says, send away all of those who have fear in their heart. Why do you do that? Because God said in his instructions in Exodus, when you go to war, you ask everybody, is anybody afraid in here right now to go to battle right now? It's a really good question every general should ask his soldiers. Like, we're about to go stand in a line in a formation and walk slowly towards the enemy and try to stab that guy or shoot that guy with an arrow. War is horrific. I've killed people in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and it is the most intimate, brutal, disgusting, physically violent, retraction thing you've ever seen. The smells, the terror, people wetting themselves and grabbing their pants. It is horrifying. And they're standing there looking at that, knowing in 10 minutes I'm about to go wage into that. Maybe they just watched 2,000 of their buddies die in front of them. It's terrifying. And so God said, if your heart is filled with fear, go back home. You got work to be done at home that you can't do here. And so he made a provision for the people that were still entrenched in the fear to go away so that those that had the courage could stand there together and not turn when everybody else is fleeing and become cowards. Because it's very easy to run when it all goes to bad. It's a lot easier to run when it all goes to go. So God starts to call Gideon in again, and he says, there's still far too many people here. And he's facing an army of hundreds of thousands. And now you're looking at a few thousand. And he goes, far too many. And so God goes through testing the hearts of the people again, and he comes to a place where there's just a couple hundred guys standing there with him. And he goes, that's my guys. Right there. So they grab a shofar, and they grab torches, and they grab a pot, and he gives them a strategy to go behind the camp of the enemy and surround them. So that this little tiny troop goes around this massive army and they blow their shofars at night and they shatter those pots and these torches light up and the people in the camp of hundreds of thousands are filled with terror and the few destroy the many. And God's story over and over and over again is the weak shaming the strong, is the foolish things shaming the wise. So when I get in rooms like this, I get very excited because there is never going to be a time where what we talk about from up here is going to be extraordinarily popular. It won't happen. I would love for people to come to these truths, but not all the truths that are being talked about are ever going to be popular, especially the gospel message. The gospel message is always for the few. It is always for the few. Few are they that find it. But I am so thankful that each and every one of you is willing to share that time, is willing to go to those people that are in your life. And by you speaking that, you may be the very person who is sowing that water into that rock and going to crack that foundation. You may never get to see that in your lifetime. You may go home today and die immediately. Jerry was on his way out here at the airport in Denver, and they start calling over the intercom, asking anybody who's a doctor to immediately get to gate 58. Jared walks up past the gate, what does he see? They're doing compressions on a guy who's got his shirt torn open and they're pumping away on his chest, desperately trying to keep him alive because he's dead. He walked off that plane, just like a lot of us are gonna do, and he dropped dead. What then do you do with that? They were able to resuscitate that guy and bring him back to life. But each and every one of you has a single day countdown ticking away. Every single moment that you have is a gift. People woke up on days not knowing that they were going to die. But I woke up knowing that I was going to kill that person today. I think they would have lived differently. We've all heard messages about live like it's your last day and all the rest of it. But it doesn't work. 
We're wired to be present tense. We can't even think about that because we insulate ourselves from death. We don't want to think about it. We don't want to make it a reality. We're going to hide our graveyards and cemeteries in the corners of our city so we don't have to think about death as a reality. But it's imminent. It is imminent. And wrath comes upon us if we are not found in a relationship with the one who made us. And I could not stand here today and be accountable before God if I did not warn you that that is coming for you. And you are accountable for what you do with the messages and the truths that you've been entrusted with today. Are you willing to suffer the scorn of men for the sake of the truth? I think a lot of us have suffered for the sake of something other than the truth in our life. And I'm hoping each and every one of you will make a decision today that you will carry forth this truth that you've learned in this room, that you will go test them for yourself, and when you've come to the place of truth, that you will be vulnerable and willing enough to share with the people that are entrusted into your life. You have influence in your lives. As little as you may think you have, you have influence in the lives of the people around you. Sarah left that conference not knowing the moment that she walked into it, I'm going to host a conference in Canada in a few months. Was that on your radar, Sarah? No. But Joe Garcia, the man who hosted that conference, and people who got up on the stage, challenged people to take the messages they received here, to go and study for themselves, and to do likewise. You know, I'm not telling everybody here to go start a conference. If you should, go and do it. Go and do it. We need lots more of these things happening. A lot more people need to hear this message than had ever heard it. A lot more people need to study and find out what is going on in this world around them. And you know what? The younger generation is coming. And they are looking at you guys wondering why the heck you didn't talk about this stuff before. Why has nobody talked about this stuff? And they are so hungry for answers that this world is not giving them that they will look to anything to tell them it. And so because of that, we're seeing this rise of occultism and new age ideologies and new apostolic reformations and all kinds of heresies that are infecting their minds because the world will give them answers to the questions they have. They are questioning everything. They know that their parents believe lies. A very common lie in America is if you, go to a, if you grow up in a nice house and you go to a good college and you get a good job, you can work 40 years, retire off 40% of what you couldn't live off of before you went to work, and then you can all live happily ever after. And every one of us watched our parents not have that play out. Why, why is it that our parents are 70 years old and they're still working? They're miserable. And they've been miserable the whole time. And so we sit there and we go, well, I think that's a bunch of baloney. So what are we going to do now? And so they look around and they know that the scientific world that we've all been given is also full of holes. And so they're looking for a sense of spirituality that they know is there that they can go and test and verify by taking some DMT or LSD and go have a spiritual experience instantly. They can immediately tap into the spiritual realm. It's not something far off. You can go on YouTube today and find out recipes to make these things at home, and so you can experience it for yourself. They are apologists for their faith. Every single day, the most popular podcast in the world, The Joe Rogan Experience, advocates that people experience psychedelic transhallucinations so that they themselves can come into contact with the things that will cure them. That don't worry, if you go on an ayahuasca trip, if you travel down and have a shaman go and guide you through that, that this being and these forces will come to you and they'll cure you of your heroin addiction. Yeah, I can go show you 250,000 testimonials of people that have been cured of different addictions and substance problems because that they engage in that spiritual realm. Why are our testimonies not there? Because we're afraid of what people will think of us. It's because we are cowards. But so is Paul. So is Peter. Why does everybody call Thomas the Doubting Thomas? He wasn't a doubting man. He was skeptical. That's not wrong. We should be skeptical about a guy who says he resurrected from the dead. That's a, come on, everybody ever died and did come back. Forever. But he does. Thomas was one of the most faithful followers after that. Does anybody know how Thomas died? He suffered horrifically, like every one of those disciples did. But you know what he also did? He found a joy that was unquenchable. He had a hope that was in him that was eternal because he'd seen with his eyes. I have seen with my eyes this spiritual realm. I have seen with my eyes that dragon that is on the cover of that book because he came to devour people I loved. There is a physical, clear, and present danger in your midst and it is coming through your television, it is coming through your phone, and it wants to devour your heart. 
Who is going to stand in defense of those people that are the innocents that do not know what they are battling? We are supposed to be the ones that destroy the works of the devil. We are supposed to go to the gates of hell itself and destroy the kingdom of darkness. I know what it is to infiltrate the gates of people's properties, estates, hardened compounds. I learned how to do that, and I was precise and I was calculated. And it was always more effective to send a single guy to infiltrate a building than it was ever to send an army. That's why God wants us to be his agents of influence in this world. And we do that by being willing to suffer the scourge of mockings. Mark gets on this podium and he talks about all kinds of things and he gets blasted in all kinds of ways that people would never want to experience. Robbie Davidson has been called out as an Illuminati shill. How many times, Robbie? Too many to count. If you haven't seen the Illuminati playing deck of cards, the deep state agent with Robbie Davidson's face on it, it didn't help his cause. But so many people have experienced that mocking. And it was the people like Robbie that inspired me to be willing to be bold for my faith. It was Tom Dunn and Russ Dizdar and Jared Cressman who were willing to speak the truth when it was a very unpopular message. It is never going to be popular for us to speak the truth. But I encourage each and every one of you to be willing to go and stand for something that you believe in. Share it with the people that you love. Share it with the people that you care about. And I hope that it will make a difference for you to know that there's people that will stand here and fight for you and on your behalf and pave the way. Some of the people that are up here now are forerunners on that. But there's another wave of people that needs to come up and join us and expand it and influence those people that we have in our lives. And I'm challenging you, please, be willing to do that. Be willing to do that for the sake of the truth. My wife has stuck by me through this whole journey. She's been willing to love me through it because she was in prayer one night after I talked to her about all these things. And she was distraught and terrified. <laughs> And she had no idea what to do. But she loved me. And God told her, it is very important how you react. And some of you are going to be entrusted with people coming to you throughout your life and talking to you about things that they've never told anybody else. And it's very important in how you react. When that moment of vulnerability comes, you have an opportunity to bless that person, even if they did wicked and evil things. You can bless them and love them. And you can see them be healed. I know one of the deepest hopes that Emily could have ever experienced is having her daughter walk down that aisle and have that moment that so many parents have hoped for their children, that they themselves would become a parent, that they would have grandchildren, and they would get to see their children grow old. Doesn't anybody want that for their children? That they could be better than you were? You don't want your sons to repeat the mistakes you made. God, I hope my children never have to make any of those mistakes I made. But it's likely that they will at some point too. And we have to be willing to be there for them, that we've cleared the way, that they know they can talk about this stuff, that they can come to us and be willing to expose these things for them. Are you that right now? Are you that for people in your life? Or do people know that they can be trusted to talk to you? You're the only one that can answer that question. You're going to be the only ones that can ever teach those things to the other people around you. And so I'm asking you to be vulnerable enough to do that in your lives. I know there's a great many of you who have long journeys to go, and you've got a long place to feeling, to, to get to a time that you can find freedom in your own life, and I hope you do. Because I was a man who had been full of fury throughout my life, but I've been filled with a faith that is unshakable. And that's the new foundation on which I built my life. And I hope each of you will be willing to find that foundation in the God of the Bible and to trust in Him because He's the only one that can save you. Thank you so much. So I just want to personally say thank you. Um, yeah, I had, uh, I was kind of, you know, it started kind of as a little chat about maybe doing some kind of a meetup, and it's turned into this, and I am so thankful to my Heavenly Father, 
and to everybody along this journey that has helped um, giving me input, all of you guys are buying tickets and showing up here, um, and we'll see, maybe we'll do it again next year. Yes. Father, we just thank you that uh, we've had the freedom and opportunity to gather into this roof. We just thank you for the hospitality and the generosity of those that put this on. Lord, we just pray that there would be much fruit that comes from this conference and would benefit your kingdom. And Lord, we're just so grateful for the love and care that you have bestowed upon us by giving us these truths and the ability to share uh, our experiences and our thoughts of, with people of like mind. Lord, thank you for the fellowship this weekend as it refreshes us to be in the midst of those that think like we do, that we can have conversations with uh, maybe friends that will be friends for a lifetime uh, after we leave this place. I pray that you would just bestow traveling mercies to all of us as we drive out and fly out to the various parts of the world that we live in. And uh, we just praise your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.